The funeral was supposed to be the moment that five-year-old Joshua could finally have some closure from losing his mother, Muriel. But her sisters had different ideas about this as they wanted to sell the house Joshua was not the owner of and keep the money for themselves. But they first had to place him out of Muriel's house. They succeed. But years later, Joshua manages to take his revenge on his mother's horrible sisters. The sisters had not thought about Joshua in years now. They had sold their sister Muriel's house and then wanted nothing to do with him anymore. All they wanted was to enjoy all the money they made. But that enjoyment was only short-lived. They may have forgotten about Joshua, but Joshua had not forgotten about them. He had found some help, allowing him to take the appropriate revenge on his mother's sister. He wanted to make them pay for what they had put him through. And when the two women were finally confronted with the consequences of their actions, all they could do was beg for forgiveness from the young boy. But how did Muriel even get this big house? Why had her sisters hatched such an even scheme? And how would Joshua take revenge on them? Everybody at the funeral found it very difficult to speak as they knew that there were no words to describe this situation, and none of them wanted to look bad in front of Muriel's now motherless son, Joshua. Some because they genuinely cared, but others had different intentions. And those with bad intentions were mainly focused on what was left behind for Joshua. Everybody could acknowledge that this was a tragedy, as she was perfectly healthy and happy and there was no indication that her life would be over so soon. Some people also saw an opportunity in Muriel's incredibly sudden passing at a young age. That opportunity came from her not having had the time to get everything in order and documented in case she died. The family knew that she did not have much money, similar to the rest of them, but she did have a very nice house in her name, which was completely paid off. The only person who now had a true claim to the house was the five-year-old Joshua, who had still been living there, assisted by his grandmother ever since Muriel died. There was nobody else to take care of the poor boy, as he did not have a father either. Muriel had conceived Joshua with her then-boyfriend Lyle about six years ago now. She had only been 18 at the time and had no idea how to be a mother. Lyle was a lot older, and she was really expecting to be able to lean on him, but nothing was further from the truth. She had already noticed that his behavior started to change after he discovered the pregnancy. He became more distant and seemingly less interested in Muriel. And before Joshua was even born, she had already caught him having an affair with another woman. She gave the relationship another chance feeling like she had no other options back then. But Lyle had no intention of changing. And before Joshua was even one year old, Lyle had left the young family, wanting nothing to do with Muriel or his seam anymore. He went completely off the radar so that he would not have to pay child support. And it quickly became clear that Muriel was not going to get a penny out of that man, nor was Joshua. She was left with nothing and needed a way to get money quickly, as her family also did not seem interested in helping her at all, even if they would have been able to. As Muriel was a very beautiful woman, she had a couple of options to choose from. She could go out on the street and sell her body, or even try to do this online with a service like OnlyFans. But this was more her backup option, which she luckily did not have to use. The first thing Muriel would end up doing brought her by far the most success. She made an account on a website catering to women looking for sugar daddies. And it did not take long before Muriel had got one hook, line, and sinker. This man was immediately head over heels in love with her. Muriel and this man met up a lot over the past couple of months. And while he did not just want to give her money, he also did not want her and Joshua to live with either him or on the street. And so he bought them a very nice house without a mortgage under a few conditions. Joshua was only four at the time 
when the sugar daddy decided that he no longer found Muriel interesting and broke off the relationship. But he kept his word, putting the house in Muriel's name, as she had been nothing but loyal and good to him. Finally, things started to look up for the young woman, and then the unthinkable happened. Muriel was only able to enjoy a house and freedom from her sugar daddy before she met her untimely death. A car accident was the cause. Somebody served into the other lane to avoid hitting an animal and crashed into Muriel's car at full speed. There was nothing anybody could have done to save her. At least the funeral was a very worthy goodbye to a woman who had done everything to give her son Joshua the best life possible. She wanted the very best for her boy, but sadly her family had other ideas about this. They just wanted the best for themselves and did not care if Joshua would suffer a bit from this. It was mainly Muriel's two sisters who had made an evil plan to get their hands on the house. They wanted to sell it for top dollar and instantly lift themselves out of their poor life. They just needed to place Joshua out of the house and convince their mother that it was for the best. After Muriel's death, they started visiting the house more and more, while before that, they had never shown any interest in their nephew Joshua. Their mother could have noted this behavior as a bit strange, but she was mostly just happy to see them as she could use all the help she could get. The sisters cleverly used their mother being so swapped by everything surrounding raising Joshua to their advantage. They started to tell her how impressed they were that she was actually doing this, and if she was prepared to carry this burden for the next 13 years, if not longer. While she herself would, of course, only get older and weaker. Everything they said was aimed to make their mother realize how difficult the next 1.5 decades were going to be. And it was obviously working as she started to carefully look for solutions. She started to realize that this was maybe going to be a bit too much for her. And the sisters were very much prepared for this already. One of the sisters, Erica, had a husband and told their mother that they would love to raise Joshua as their own. She and her husband had already been talking about trying to have children, and adopting Joshua was perfect for them. It all sounded too good to be true, but Muriel's mother was convinced that this was by far the best solution to the problem, and she wasted no time getting the paperwork in order. Little did she know that if Joshua was officially and legally put into a person's care, then that person would also get control over everything Joshua owned, including the house. From that moment, everything started going really fast for the family. With Joshua now in Erica's care, the house that his mother had gotten from her sugar daddy was now empathy, and the sisters wasted no time putting it on the market without their mother or Joshua knowing. But it was not like Joshua cared at the time. He had become very numb to everything that was happening around him since his mother had passed. He had clearly not gotten over it yet, and how could he? It all happened so suddenly and left a lasting imprint on the still very much developing boy. They did not put the house up for sale for a very high price, so it did not take long for bids to start flooding in. And while Erica and her sister were busy trying to get the best price for the house, Joshua was very much neglected in this whole ordeal. Erica's husband, Michael, was a nice man, but he was working 55 plus hour weeks to keep the family head above water, so he had no time to spend with Joshua. This is why he also was not against Erica making a lot of money by selling the house of Muriel, even though he did feel really bad for the poor boy. Not even Joshua's grandmother was coming by as she went on vacation for a month to really process everything that had happened in these past months. She, of course, also lost one of her daughters and had to take a lot of responsibility in arranging the funeral. But this left Joshua completely alone. Joshua's days melded into a blur of silence and shadows in Erica and Michael's home. His room, though comfortably furnished, felt alien 
lacking the warmth and memories of his mother's house. At night, he'd curl up under the blankets, clutching a faded photograph of his mother, the edges worn from his touch. Meals were quiet affairs. Erica tried to engage him in conversation, but words often got lost in his sea of thoughts. The television's laughter from sitcoms seemed to mock his sorrow, a stark contrast to the hollowness he felt inside. Michael would sometimes sit beside him, offering a tentative pat on the back, but the comfort felt distant, like echoes in an empty hallway. Joshua longed for the familiar, his mother's gentle voice, the creak of the floorboard outside his old bedroom, reminders of a life abruptly snatched away. At school, Joshua wandered through the halls like a ghost, his presence barely acknowledged by his peers. The playground, once a place of joy and raucous laughter, now felt like an arena of judgment. Whispers followed him, some of pity, others of curiosity. Children, unsure how to approach the boy who had lost everything, kept their distance, leaving Joshua isolated in his grief. The bullies, however, sensed an easy target in his vulnerability. They would snicker and nudge each other as he passed, their words like barbs, hey, look, it's the boy with no mom. Each taunt was a sharp reminder of his loss, reopening the wound that refused to heal. Teachers offered sympathetic glances, but their overtures of help were lost in the cacophony of Joshua's internal struggles. Michael watched Joshua with a growing sense of helplessness. Balancing a demanding job and the unexpected responsibility of a grieving child, he felt stretched thin. At work, his mind would drift to Joshua's solemn face, wondering if there was more he could do to bridge the chasm of sadness. Conversations with Erica about Joshua were brief, often ending with, he'll adjust in time. But Michael wasn't so sure. He recognized the signs of deep-seated trauma, the vacant stares, the listless movements, the silence that seemed to engulf the boy. The desire to help battled with the reality of his limited time and emotional bandwidth, leaving Michael in a constant state of inner turmoil. He wished he could do more, be more for Joshua, but the demands of life were unrelenting. The truth came crashing down on an ordinary afternoon. Joshua was rummaging through a drawer in Erica's study, looking for a pencil, when his fingers stumbled upon a stack of papers. Curious, he pulled them out, his eyes scanning the legal jargon. And then he saw it the deed of sale for his mother's house, signed by Erica and her sister. The realization hit him like a tidal wave. His mother's house, his last connection to her, had been sold right from under him. The room spun as he pieced together the betrayal. They had taken everything from him, his home, his memories, and now his mother's legacy. The paper trembled in his hands each word a confirmation of the treachery that had been festering under the guise of familial care. Joshua sat on the floor, the papers scattered around him, a storm of emotions raging within. Betrayal burned in his chest, a searing flame that consumed all other feelings. He felt deceived, used, a pawn in a cruel game played by those he was supposed to trust. Anger bubbled up, fierce and unyielding, directed at his aunts, at Erica, at the world that had taken his mother and now robbed him of his home. But beneath the anger lay a deep, aching sadness, a realization that he truly was alone in this world. Tears blurred his vision, a mix of grief and rage as he grappled with the magnitude of what had been done to him. The room felt suffocating, the walls closing in, as he mourned not just for his mother, but for the life they had once shared, now irrevocably gone. In the stillness of his room, Joshua's thoughts began to coalesce into a form of quiet resolve. The injustice of the situation gnawed at him, demanding action. 
He knew he couldn't let his aunts get away with their betrayal. But how? He was just a kid. What power did he have? The idea started as a mere spark. Maybe he could fight back somehow. It wasn't about the house or the money. It was about honor, about his mother's memory. He needed a plan, something clever and foolproof. As he lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, ideas began to dance in his mind, each a step towards retribution and justice. This wasn't just for him. It was for his mother, for their stolen life together. At school, amidst the sea of indifferent faces, Joshua found an unexpected ally. Mr. Simmons, his English teacher, noticed the boy's withdrawn demeanor and offered a listening ear. Hesitant at first, Joshua found himself opening up about the house, his mother, and the betrayal he felt. Mr. Simmons listened intently, his eyes reflecting a mix of sorrow and anger. That's not right, Joshua, he said, his voice firm. We need to find a way to set this right. For the first time since his mother's death, Joshua felt a glimmer of hope. Here was someone who believed in him, who was willing to stand by his side. It was more than support. It was a partnership in his quest for justice. Armed with Mr. Simmons's encouragement, Joshua set out to gather evidence. He meticulously collected every piece of information related to the house sale. The deed, bank statements, and even emails he found on Erica's computer. Each document was a piece of the puzzle, revealing the depth of his aunt's deception. He compiled everything in a folder, marked Truth. It was more than just a collection of papers, it was a testament to his mother's memory and his resolve to fight for it. With each document, Joshua's case grew stronger, his resolve firmer. He wasn't just a powerless child anymore, he was a crusader for justice. Joshua and Mr. Simmons spent evenings discussing legal strategies. They researched laws on inheritance and fraud, combed through legal forums, and even consulted with a lawyer friend of Mr. Simmons. It was a daunting task, navigating the complex legal system, but Joshua was determined. He learned about guardianship rights, property laws, and the legal process for contesting a will. Every step was a step towards reclaiming what was rightfully his. The legal maze was confusing, but with each piece of knowledge, Joshua felt empowered. He was building a fortress of law around his case, preparing for the day he would confront his aunts in court. The confrontation happened on a brisk autumn day. Joshua, armed with his folder of evidence, faced his aunts. You stole my mother's house, he accused, his voice steady despite his racing heart. The sisters exchanged glances, their faces a mix of surprise and disdain. Oh, Joshua. One aunt scoffed, you're just a child. What do you know about houses and money? They brushed off his accusations, confident in their control over the situation. But Joshua wasn't deterred. He held their gaze, his eyes burning with a fire fueled by betrayal and loss. This wasn't the end. It was just the beginning. They had underestimated him but he would show them just how wrong they were. Joshua's resolve hardened in the face of his aunt's scornful dismissal. Their underestimation of him only fueled his determination. He wasn't just fighting for the house or material gain. This was a battle for justice, for honoring his mother's memory. Alone in his room, his resolve crystallized. He would not be silenced or brushed aside. This fight was bigger than him. It was a fight for what was right and just. Each dismissive word from his aunts was now a catalyst, pushing him further and strengthening his resolve. He began to see himself not as a victim of their greed, but as a champion of his mother's legacy. In the quiet of his room, Joshua began laying the groundwork for his plan. He knew he needed to be strategic, to operate under the radar. 
he started documenting his life with Erica and Michael, recording his thoughts and feelings in a journal. He gathered all the evidence he had compiled about the house sale and began to organize it systematically. He also started learning about social media and how to use it effectively. His plan required precision and secrecy. He couldn't afford to tip off his ants before he was ready. Every night, under the dim light of his desk lamp, Joshua worked on his plan, each step meticulously thought out. Joshua began to share his story with a few close friends at school. To his surprise, they were sympathetic and outraged on his behalf. Word of his plight slowly spread through the school and then to the local community. People were shocked and empathetic. Many couldn't believe that his own family could betray him so callously. Support began to build, first as a trickle, then as a steady stream. It was no longer just Joshua's fight. The community started rallying behind him. He received encouraging messages, offers of help, and even small acts of kindness that bolstered his spirits. His story, once confined to the walls of his room, was now a community cause. The local news caught wind of Joshua's story and a small article appeared in the community section of the newspaper. A reporter, touched by the boy's plight, decided to delve deeper. She visited Joshua, interviewed him and Mr. Simmons, and even managed to get a statement from the school. The story, once published, garnered significant attention. It wasn't just a local news piece anymore. It resonated with people. The article painted Joshua as a brave young boy, fighting against familial injustice. The community's support intensified, and Joshua's story began to gain traction beyond the local confines. As Joshua's story gained more attention, a buzz began to build. The initial article led to more media inquiries. Local radio stations mentioned his story, and a regional news channel expressed interest in an interview. Social media started to pick up the narrative, with people sharing his story and expressing their support. The public's curiosity and empathy were piqued. Meanwhile, Joshua watched this growing interest with a mix of anxiety and hope. This was the momentum he needed, but it also meant that things were getting bigger than he had initially imagined. The tension was palpable. His story was on the cusp of breaking into a much larger arena. Erica and her sister remained blissfully ignorant of the storm brewing around Joshua's story. They laughed off the local news article, convinced it was just a small town story that would fade away. He's just a child seeking attention, they told each other, confident in their control over the situation. Their overconfidence blinded them to the growing public interest in Joshua's plight. They continued their lives, untouched by the undercurrents of support rallying behind Joshua. They had underestimated the power of a community united by a shared sense of justice and the resolve of a young boy wronged. Joshua's story, once a mere whisper in the local community, began to gain substantial traction. The regional news coverage added fuel to the growing fire. Social media buzzed with discussions about his situation, with hashtags linking to his story. People from neighboring towns and cities started reaching out, offering support, and sharing similar stories. The narrative of a young boy standing against familial betrayal resonated deeply. Joshua watched in awe as what started as a personal mission was now garnering regional attention. The momentum was building, each new share, each new article, adding to the wave that was forming. There was a sense of inevitability in the air, a feeling that Joshua's story was about to break out in a significant way. The signs were all there, increasing shares on social media, more in-depth discussions on online forums, and increased media inquiries. Joshua felt a mixture of excitement and nervousness. He knew this was the storm he had been waiting for, the one that would finally bring his plight into the national spotlight. He braced himself, 
knowing that the story's viral explosion was not just a possibility, but a looming reality. The tension was palpable as Joshua's story hovered on the brink of a major breakthrough. It was the calm before the storm, a moment of suspenseful anticipation. Joshua and Mr. Simmons double-checked their strategy, ensuring they were prepared for the potential outcomes. The community, too, seemed to hold its breath, waiting for the story to make the leap from regional interest to national awareness. There was a sense that something significant was about to happen, a pivotal moment that would change everything. Joshua's plan was on the cusp of realization. The story had reached a critical mass, teetering on the edge of national recognition. The regional media coverage had sown the seeds, and now the national news networks were showing interest. Social media metrics showed an exponential increase in engagement. Joshua felt a mix of exhilaration and fear. This was it, the moment he had been working towards. The narrative he had carefully crafted was about to break wide open, and the world would finally hear his story in its entirety. The stage was set for a revelation that would shake the foundations of his aunt's betrayal. As the momentum of his story grew, Joshua meticulously prepared for the final reveal. He and Mr. Simmons crafted a detailed press release, outlining the sister's betrayal and the emotional toll it had taken on him. They planned a live interview with a national news channel, ensuring Joshua's story would be heard far and wide. They gathered all the evidence, legal documents, the sale deed, and personal testimonials. Joshua practiced his speech, refining each word to convey the right mix of emotion and resolve. This was more than just a story. It was his life, his truth. He wanted the world to understand the depth of his loss and the deceit he had faced. Everything was set. Now, it was just a matter of time. Meanwhile, Erica and her sister remained blissfully unaware of the impending storm. They continued their daily routines, confident in their belief that Joshua's efforts would amount to nothing more than a minor disturbance. They scoffed at the local news coverage, unable to fathom the growing national interest in Joshua's story. In their overconfidence, they missed the subtle shifts in public opinion, the increasing chatter on social media, and the growing anticipation of a major reveal. They remained in their bubble, oblivious to the tidal wave of justice that was about to crash down upon them. Joshua's story began to capture the nation's attention. Prominent news channels started discussing his plight, inviting legal experts to analyze the case. Social media influencers shared his story, expressing outrage and sympathy. The narrative of a brave young boy standing up against familial injustice struck a chord with a wider audience. People from all walks of life began to follow his journey, waiting eagerly for the next development. Joshua's story was no longer just a local issue. It had become a national conversation about justice, betrayal, and the resilience of a young heart. Joshua's story teetered on the verge of going viral. Anticipation was built as the date of the live interview approached. Social media was abuzz with speculation and support. Justice for Joshua began trending, with thousands of people expressing their support for his cause. News outlets teased snippets of the upcoming interview, further fueling public interest. The narrative had reached a critical tipping point. It was no longer a question of if, but when it would explode into the national consciousness. Joshua, at the center of this whirlwind, felt a mix of apprehension and readiness. The world was watching, and he was ready to tell his story. Public opinion shifts as the narrative continued to build. Public sentiment began to turn sharply against the sisters. People were appalled by their actions, expressing anger and disbelief at how they had treated Joshua. The once sympathetic whispers turned into loud voices of condemnation. The sisters, once confident in their control over the situation, 
found themselves becoming the villains in a story that was being followed by millions. The court of public opinion was in session, and the verdict was increasingly clear. The tide had turned. The sisters were no longer the powerful figures they believed themselves to be, but were now at the mercy of a narrative they had grossly underestimated. Joshua's story erupted across the nation like a viral wildfire. On the day of the live interview, millions tuned in, captivated by the young boy's tale of betrayal and resilience. As he spoke, his words resonated with authenticity and pain, touching the hearts of viewers. Social media exploded with Nandar Justice for Joshua, trending globally. People from all corners of the country shared his story, expressing outrage and solidarity. Celebrities and influencers lent their voices, amplifying the narrative. The story was no longer just news. It had become a movement, a rallying cry for justice and empathy. Joshua, once a lone voice against injustice, was now the center of a national outcry. The public reaction was immediate and overwhelming. Support poured in for Joshua from all over the country. People expressed their admiration for his courage and determination. Many were appalled by the sisters' actions, calling for swift justice. The story sparked discussions about familial betrayal and legal ethics. Advocacy groups and legal experts weighed in, offering support and guidance. Donations and legal assistance offers flooded in, bolstering Joshua's case. The nation had not just heard his story, they had embraced it standing with Joshua in his fight for justice. The viral shaming reached its zenith, exerting immense pressure on the sisters. The weight of public opinion and the threat of legal repercussions became too much to bear. Faced with overwhelming public backlash and legal challenges, they were forced to concede. In a dramatic turn of events, the sisters agreed to return the proceeds from the house sale to Joshua. It was a victory not just in legal terms, but moral as well. Joshua had sought justice and, against all odds, had achieved it. The sisters' reputation was irreparably tarnished, and they were left to face the consequences of their actions in the full glare of the national spotlight. The legal and social fallout for the sisters was severe. They faced legal proceedings for their actions with the potential for further penalties. Their social standing crumbled. They became pariahs in their community, shunned by those who once knew them. The story of their greed and betrayal was now a cautionary tale, a stark reminder of the consequences of deceit. For Joshua, the aftermath was a mix of relief and vindication. His story not only brought justice, but also raised awareness about issues like inheritance fraud and the rights of minors. He had become an unwitting hero, a symbol of resilience and justice. In the quiet aftermath, Joshua reflected on his incredible journey. From the depths of despair and betrayal, he had risen, driven by a quest for justice. He thought about his mother, hoping she would be proud of what he had accomplished. The experience had changed him. He had grown stronger and more resilient. He looked to the future with newfound hope. The money from the house sale would secure his education and future. But more importantly, he had learned about the power of his voice and the strength that lies in standing up for what is right. The journey was arduous, but it led him to a place of closure and the promise of new beginnings.